I mean, in, in England, things are very different because uh, suddenly in England, although, I mean, they're often when Africans arrive in England around the same time, there is some connection through slavery because England does not have slavery within its territories, within its mainland territories at that time. The Africans that we find in 16th century London are, are free. I mean, they're not enslaved. They can't be enslaved. As I mean, later on, you find, um, yeah, things get a little bit shakier because the, the the law accommodates the fact that there is slavery in a wider British Empire. But um, at this time, yeah, so we have um, somebody who called a, a, a guy called Reasonable Blackman, um, who is a silk weaver, for example. We find people doing all sorts of artisan jobs. We find people doing specialist diving work, um, for example. So we have a couple of Venetian divers um, who are originally African and they come via Venice and they work on salvaging um, objects from a shipwreck in the um, just off the south coast of England and that's in the middle of the 16th century. So certainly there are plenty of skilled African artisans who are working in different roles. Um, either, ha I mean, often, yeah, there haven't been some connection to their initial arrival um, that has to do with transport on ships from slave trading countries, whether or not they are personally enslaved. But then, yeah, settle down and we can track their reason, we can track their um, marriages and baptisms and kind of, you know, engagement in the local community. And I think at this, the, there is research ongoing um, around examples of people in similar situations in Italy. And obviously Italy is kind of distinct from England um, in that regard, because there isn't the kind of, you know, if you get to England in some ways and, and you have been um, made a slave, then you kind of get lucky to some extent because that can't necessarily be continued once you're in England. In Italy, it can be because Italy has a, a domestic law that um, the Italian, all the, the Italian states allow slavery to continue um, on the peninsula in a way that England did not. And I think, you know, so th this is a little bit of a distinction according to, to, to where any given African migrant might live. But yeah, absolutely. There are people doing all sorts of artisan jobs and obviously you know in terms of shipping across the mediterranean yeah we see people come and go in all sorts of um different places i mean there's what that there are yeah examples of people um in mediterranean navies we've got and, and as i say in armies as well so there's lots of you know yeah i think i think one of the things is that there's still lots and lots more to do in terms of digging in the archives, finding exactly what was going on and how many different um, Africans in Europe were doing exactly what. Um, and, you know, there are researchers doing that work now, but it still um, is yet to come out and yet to be published. I don't know if you want to spend some more time there before we move to the, the Alessandro story, because I have a few things to ask there. Uh, because, you know, why I'm trying to sort of uh, um, stress on this question is so that we can correct the error that the way you look at African, it is a lame person who have never left this, his continent. Mm -hmm. The only reason he could live there was because somebody came to take him out mm -hmm. to another place. That is how he knew Europe. I think that is wrong. It is not true. When Hadiba was coming to uh, attack Rome, they didn't need the European to come and take him. If we continue to go on the narration that, ah, Africa only got here through the help of another person, eh, I think that is not, it's not, it's not fair enough. So, historically speaking, is there any trace that you can find of Africa that have got into Europe on their own? Is there anything well, you can share yeah, with me? I mean, oh. <laughs> I think the, 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 the issue here, I think, is that nobody is sitting there in the south of Sicily ticking off in a book the boats that come across. Like this is, the, I mean, so this is the, and clearly, like, there are lots of people who just come and go, but this is not a world with border controls in the same way. I mean, yeah, there are questions about who is a citizen and who is entitled to, um, assistance and so on um 
but you can just go places. I mean, you can take a small boat and sail across the Mediterranean. And I mean, the thing is for, for historians, one of the tricky, tricky things that is that nobody is monitoring that. Um, so we have not got no, got no records with which to show exactly how many people are moving. And we have also got no records. I mean, you know, monitoring by, um, you know, asking questions in official surveys about race. It's a very, very new thing. I mean, why would you specify if you if you're a local um, lawyer in Sicily, for example, um, and you are writing a contract document. I mean, you have no reason to write down anybody's skin color in that contract document. But yet those contract documents are very often the only sort of evidence that we've got of um, the ordinary lives of people who are engaged in business or, or you know, buying and selling a, a field to farm. Um, so a lot of the time we just don't have the documents to know exactly um, what any given person's origin is, unless for some reason somebody in the system has decided to write down, oh, um, African or black or from Guinea or one of the other kind of indicators that might give you a hint. But most of the time, I mean, you know, you go you go out and I don't know buy a buy a car or something. You take out some finance to buy the car. You don't. I mean, they don't put in that contract document where you're from <laughs> they just put your name right so that's what we that's that's kind of what we have to deal with like as historians is that a lot of the time it was didn't uh, feel uh, relevant to anybody to write this down and so we don't actually know exactly what's happening with that kind of with, with that element of voluntary migration which i'm sure exists but it's it's kind of one of those things it's sort of irony that because <laughs> slave traders were in dealing in buying and selling they cared about keeping records of their money they produced a lot of paperwork about what they were doing so they got really good records yeah because yeah. yeah, they, they they, there was there was a load of money involved and whereas you know people who were just moving for their own business they you know that the documents just don't kind of survive in the same way so it's much much harder to piece together that side of the historical experience than it is to do for the for the thing where it was a lot about the white Europeans trying to make themselves some money. You know, this this is the the, the the real challenge that I think we've got. Thank you for that. Yeah, that is true. And and when that is the situation, it is a very tedious work to do. And what I often say to um, African academia, African writer here, is that you will be doing a disservice to yourself when you are expecting the European to tell your story because it will never happen. Because it's difficult for them to even tell their story. How could you expect them to tell your story? Um, yeah, now, think, look at... Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, just, I just want to say as well that I think like a lot of European historians until very, very recently, and even to some extent now, are quite, um, you know, were, were quite suspicious of and quite hostile to the fact that a lot of... That in a lot of Africa, history was traditionally an oral form, right? It wasn't written down. So Europeans kind of wrote down history in history books and had a written record of history, whereas um, in a lot of African countries, it was more typically sung or recited. It, there's like there's an oral tradition of doing history. And a lot of Europeans just kind of thought, well, that's just not as valuable as our type of doing history. And so therefore, they would kind of discount a lot of historical knowledge because they didn't sort of see it as being proper according to their standards and I think now like the, the attitudes towards that are somewhat beginning to change but it's still a very um yeah there's there's still a lot of European historians out there who kind of think that if it wasn't a written text that it's not quite as good so that again is another big barrier to get over in understanding um historical relationships between Europe and Africa because it's like the, the typically European historians and also African historians who be, who've had kind of come to Europe and had the European training and how to do history properly as we put it like get a get a particular view that has really valorized European sources over um, the oral tradition of history that that you, you know you have in Africa.